Welcome to Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, the podcast that gives you a peek inside the minds of some truly inspirational teachers. This week, I'm joined by none other than John Hutchinson, as we sit down to talk all things curriculum, as well as the new early career framework, and how we can make sure that it meets its aims in the way that we know it needs to. It was an absolute pleasure to sit down and talk all things education with John, and I think you're going to enjoy it just as much as I did. But before we get started, one of our many Australian listeners, Annalise Tixon, is putting one foot forward by walking 100 kilometres for the Black Dog Institute, a mental health charity down under. And she's going to be listening to her favourite education podcast as she does those 100 kilometres. Now, I don't know about you, but I would find it difficult to drive 100 kilometres, let alone walk it. Mental health is something that has come up quite a few times already in this season of Thinking Deeply About Primary Education. So it felt only right to give a shout out. Annalise has set a modest target of $50. And I think we, even if we donated $1 each, could really help her make a difference. But without further ado, let's spend some time thinking deeply about primary education. Thank you very much for joining me today, John. My absolute pleasure. A real pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. I think people who listen regularly will be familiar that we always sort of start with our guests and numbers to get a feel for who they are, where they're from. And my first question to you is years as a teacher. Uh, eight. First year group taught? Year three. Always, year, you, new teachers always put them in year three. <laughs> Last year group taught? Uh, year five. Most important year group? Uh, I'll say reception although I'd like to say naught to three. It's not a year group, but um, reception. I get that. Favourite year group? Six. Blog posts? 75. Impressive. Blog hits? Overall, um, 132,598. Wow. I did, I did have to look that up. I don't just like have that on my like on my wall with like a whiteboard, like <laughs> I don't update it daily. I'm not that obsessive over it. Um yeah. And it's been a little while. Um it's been a little while since I blogged actually. Um so it was quite nice going back into it to sort of like check all of that out and gave me a bit of maybe a bit of a spur to 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 try and get on a bit of the old blogging. Um I sort of feel like blogging. Maybe it's had a bit of a renaissance, but I think the, the Twitter thread killed blogging a little bit. Do you think that? Yeah, with the extension to towards, was it 240 characters? And then, you know, put seven yeah. of those together, you've got a blog. <laughs> right, exactly. And people seem, it seems like people are mu much more likely to, like I find it with myself, like if somebody has like one of nine, then I'm like, yeah, I'll scroll through and read this. Um, whereas if somebody says I've written a blog, it's just that effort, how lazy, that effort of clicking <laughs> to go into the blog post <laughs> feels like one step too far. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the way we've been conditioned, isn't it? To move, you know, because blogging was, it must have been about what, close to 20 years ago, whenever things started getting first for probably sort of released online and stuff. And um, yeah, since then we've just, you know, it needs to be instant or it's not getting our attention, you know, but I, I revisited the blog to sort of help me prepare for the questions and things. And, you know, I, it's one of my favorites, you know, it, it's always really well written and um, always makes me think as well, which is, I, I suppose, the main reason I read about education. Yeah, so it's, it's a great, and everyone should check it out. And then potentially the most important question, tweets. How many tweets have I sent? This will be potentially 22,400 that's not as bad as I thought it would be actually <laughs> that's not totally embarrassing <laughs> my, my sort of like my, my, my wife's telling me that I spend too much time tweeting and being on Twitter um 22,000 I joined in 2013 so I'll take that that's okay that's not that's not quite obsessive <laughs> <laughs> that was great <laughs> so you, you've been leading a knowledge-based curriculum project at Key Stage 2 if you had to condense your approach to a solid curriculum design into a set of guiding principles, what, what would they be? I think that the one thing that we've learned more than anything is that sequencing is what really matters in terms of curriculum. And so the, the guiding principles, we have about 11 guiding principles that are based on stuff like Dylan Williams' SAT paper on principal curriculum design. 
um, that they're sort of like underpin our curriculum. But I'll, I'll speak more, more, more generally, which hopefully will be more useful. It's the sequencing that matters. And, and, and we talk about it in terms of like, we don't think there's a right or a wrong way to sequence curriculum, but we think that there's righter and wronger ways. So in some sort of hierarchical subjects like mathematics, it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward in terms of the way that you sequence from going from sort of more, more simple to more complex, more concrete to more abstract. If we move to like subjects like geography, it's less clear because there's there are more cumulative elements to, to that, but there are also some hierarchical elements in terms of, for example, it's it's useful to know about the continental plates before you teach about mountain ranges, and so you, uh, with a little bit of forethought, you can you can put some of that in place. Understanding that the the curriculum is bigger than any one teacher, like the curriculum is something that children experience over years. That is really helpful, especially for primary teachers, because we do work in sort of silos, like we see them for a year and then adios. And I remember when we first started our curriculum project, somebody said to me like, do, you know, does it work? And my, my reply to them was ask me in five years, because <laughs> that's hopefully when you'll start to see the impact of it. Um, Because it should be cumulative and and you should get your year four teacher thanking you saying like, I was teaching them about the Benin Empire and they were talking to me about like them learning about the Roman Empire and how it really sort of like matches in terms of the way that they started to gain more more ground and, and conquer lands nearby. So that sequencing sort of being really thoughtful about that sequencing um i think is 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 definitely one of the, like the key um the key sort of like principles and that obviously get comes into stuff around sequencing the the the, the questions and the tasks and the activities and 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 stuff like which ret- like retrieval sort of having cumulative retrieval so that you're still asking children about for example ancient greece in year six even if they studied it in year two or year year three another one that we have is we assume that if they're not taught it in school, then they're not going to know it because for some kids that will be true. Maybe it sounds obvious, but I spent a lot of time basically, if, if you were taught by me for the first three or four years of my career, there was a basic, like there was an assumption that you were being taught the majority of the content at home. And if you didn't, then you probably wouldn't know anything about it. Cause in my lessons, we were, we were painting shields um, and, and some kids, and then some kids will come in and talk about Pompeii and Julius Caesar. And I'd be like, well, look, the kids know loads. And it's like, well, th- their parents taught them that you can't take credit for that. Like they went home and spoke to their parents about the Romans. So, so yeah, we, and, and I guess this comes to the knowledge rich thing, which I kind of like, cringe about a little bit now because that term has become loaded and politicized like those conversations like those debates are just so boring and, and, and very rarely about education I think um, and more about the people <laughs> making them however we we do think that it's helpful to think about the content or the or the, or the knowledge as like the starting place from planning um, and, and the sequencing um, and that's different to the approach that I took before and that, that I still do see quite often now of what I would call an activity-based curriculum, not even a skills-based curriculum, an activities-based curriculum, certainly for lots of the foundation subjects where I think I certainly began by thinking about the activities that I wanted the children to do. So whatever the topic was, volcanoes, churches, um, or places of worship, the Romans, I started off with, okay, I'm teaching them about the Romans. I've got half term Google what what activities can you do for year three Romans and you'll probably get about six weeks of, you know they can paint a shield for a couple of weeks we can get them to do the turtle on the playground we can um, get some grapes and um, tell a bridge coming in togas and like there's there's six weeks of activities and at the end of it who knows what like you would have taught them something don't get me wrong like I'm, I'm not pretending that like you never like utter sort of like 43 BC or whatever you would have taught them something, but it would be very incidental um, and you can't rely on it for next, like as a senior leader, you can't, you can't sort of say, I know that when they, when they're in year three, then they're going to know about conquest and empire. They're going to know about the difference between a republic and an empire and how Rome went from a republic to an empire. They're going to know about the Boudican revolt and what it means to sort of like revolt and client kingship and the sort of like the, what that means in terms of like power and, 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 and who wields it. And all of this is going to be tremendously helpful because it, all of these sorts of big, what we sometimes call like substantive concepts, 
they come up again and again. And also in terms of just thinking about some of the second order concepts like cause and effect, like we can we can bring those in. And so beginning with the knowledge, I think, is really helpful in terms of just starting with what do I want the kids to know by the end of the unit, um, rather than what are they going to do? They will obviously still do activities. And I'm not saying like never paint a Roman shield, like maybe you do. But it's beginning with like the, if you're thinking about planning a curriculum, we would always start with what do you want the kids to know at the end of this particular unit something that's a bit more recent um which I, i've been thinking about is basically around like the framing of that knowledge and the organization of that knowledge and so 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 something that we spent a lot more time thinking about is basically framing that that knowledge around good inquiry questions um and there's obviously a bit of overlap between like the, the word inquiry questions here is probably quite unfortunate because there are associations with like inquiry learning and discovery learning which which we don't think is a particularly good use of children's classroom time a really good inquiry question i think is a useful way to sort of like frame that knowledge for the children and and prevent it becoming like a pub quiz curriculum where you're just sort of like throwing random facts at them because they're written on a knowledge organizer so thinking about the sequencing beginning with the knowledge um, and and thinking about the knowledge to begin with um, and then thinking about how you organize that knowledge is um is is that are sort of like three big principles we then perhaps go into pedagogy or what we might call the enacted curriculum. And, and so we codify like all of our stuff into work booklets. The, the benefits of that are huge in terms of that sequencing, which is really clear what the kids are, are learning and in terms of like a, a, a entitlement to that knowledge rich curriculum, the kids knowing lots of stuff. There are huge risks associated with work booklets and the risks are you get really dull lessons. And like, we should be honest, like people on my side should be honest about that. You know, traditional teaching got a bad name for a reason, because if it is just sit at your desk, open to page three, read the text and start answering the questions, then absolutely bonfire, bonfire the booklets, because I don't like, I don't want to teach like that. I wouldn't want my kids to learn like that. And so the enacted curriculum, what, what we talk to our teachers about, and, and, and we're, we're lucky that this is being taught. There are about 150 schools at the moment who are teaching using our, our materials. We spend a lot of time talking about like, this is designed to free up the teacher to think about the enacted curriculum. Like what teachers do best is bring it to life in the classroom. They know their kids better than anybody else. Um, they know themselves better than anybody else. Uh, and what we're doing is like we're saying you don't have to spend all night finding presentations or creating your own presentations you don't have to spend all night thinking like what exactly am I going to talk about in the lesson it's there there's 500 words of text it's broken down there are the tasks in there you can now think about like how how do I bring this to life um how do I make this exciting how do I make it engaging that's a huge risk and and, and it's something that, that that we need to be like really clear on that um, just because it's work booklets and it's knowledge rich doesn't mean that it it, it, it has to be dull and that, that the kids enjoying themselves is some sort of a, a betrayal of the, of the ideals. So yeah, that's that, I think that those are the, are the main the main principles um, that, that we would talk about. Yeah, your, your last principle, you know, it, it it's almost perfectly aligned with the conversations I'm having with people about textbooks. You know, when used badly, textbooks aren't going to help any pupils understand. But like you said, they're not a straitjacket. They are the vehicle that allows you the opportunity to think about your pedagogy much more deeply, you know, so I'm 100% with you there. And did, am I right in thinking that recently history and geography materials were released? So we're, we're actually just partnered with Pearson who are, who are sort of taking over the whole project because it became a little bit too, we're only one school and we're quite a small school. We have, so we're all through, we have children from, our nursery takes children from two and, and we have a sixth form up to 18. But we only have 60 children in each year group and, and we deliberately wanted to stay as a small school because we think that we think that relationships are incredibly important and we want to maintain really strong relationships between the school and families and we basically thought that if you have 300 kids in a year group then you can't do that as easily we did the project and then lots of schools so they wanted to use the stuff and so we were like trying to find a way that we could free up enough people to sort of like manage that and so try to do that for a few years and eventually we were like look are we a publishing house or are we a school? Like we're, like we're not set up for this. And so we partnered with Pearson and they said like, we can we can do all of that sort of stuff. So we, we currently have history, geography and, and RE um, in key stage one and two. We, we do also use them in key stage three 
and four as well. Essentially one booklet per half term. So all of our kids from, from year one up to year six, they'll have at least one booklet. As they move up, they might have two because they, uh, they have di- different lessons in the, in the afternoon. There are, I think, yeah, about 24 units for history and about 24 units for, for geography. They're all written by classroom teachers. So they're all written by, and usually teachers who have, who have taught that age group or have a specialism in the, in the subject. And very often, like the teacher would like write the, the series. So it means that Kirsty wrote our, oh, sorry, we have science as well. Kirsty wrote our science booklet. She's our, she's our lead, uh, uh, our science lead in primary. And it means that we know that those booklets build and because she's seen the whole vision and the whole journey through. Nice. They, they sound immensely useful. You know, obviously my remit uh, is very math specific at the minute, but uh, if I ever do go back, uh, that'll be the first place I look for uh, inspiration, you know, because I, I really enjoy reading about British history. You know, it's, it's been necessary to upskill myself as a teacher, but um, I know that a lot of people know a whole lot more about those subjects than I do. If I can just circle back to some stuff, when you mentioned the inquiry questions, I'm imagining a question that sets up, say, perhaps an essay in which you can share all of the, the wonderful stuff you've learned about, say, the Romans. Is, is that, am I thinking of the right thing? So that's the way that I don't think that it's right or wrong, but that's the way I thought about it for quite a long time. I think I, I, more recently, I think it's probably actually we, we had this conversation literally just a few months ago with our senior leadership team in, in primary where we had a big conversation of like maybe we've got this wrong um, one of the cool things about working at reach is that like you're working with really 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 smart people and everybody's just like super open-minded and like you can just have those conversations like a lot which is great we basically thought that it's probably too big like that our reflection our kids have been writing essays um for for years now um from from year one so uh, like i i wrote a thing about that um a few years ago and people it got a good debate starting about like whether kids in primary should be writing essays our experience of it has always been very positive like our children really enjoy doing it we get great writing out of them like kids will write four five six pages about their topic that they've been learning it's a pretty easy experience for them because they know tons about it and it's actually quite enjoyable to write about something that you know tons about we were getting like some of our best non-fiction and, and and just some of our best writing out of those um sort of like essay lessons so we would do it like that we'd have small lessons small questions um in in the lessons so they'd be they'd be you know maybe a true or false or a quick like fill the gaps or like stuff to get them thinking hard about the the stuff that they're that they're learning about and, and try and promote that sort of like retention and then the, the at the end they write their big lesson like what did the romans ever do for us or something like that that's where they sort of like dump all of their knowledge we think that that's probably not the best way of doing it now and actually it would be more helpful to have several more focused inquiry questions that bring together maybe like a couple of lessons of content each i think one of the reasons is although they would get the writing was great it's it's really difficult for anybody to write six a six page essay and for it to have like great structure and sort of like organization even if you're a grown up for our year fours and fives, like some of them were doing it well, some of them less well. And when we started thinking about, well, how do we help them to, to write better essays? We, we were like, I mean, this is the wrong question. Like lots of things we need to teach them how to sort of like write good sort of like topic sentences and think about the function of a paragraph and think about the cohesion between paragraphs. And the writing revolution really helped like with a lot of that stuff. And we, and we did introduce a lot of that, a, a lot of those, but we basically thought it was too big. And so we think that actually now it would probably be better to have an, a number of smaller inquiry questions. Those questions are really difficult to write because th- there are basically sort of like disciplinarily valid and, and invalid questions um, where the, there's sort of there's questions that a historian would ask and questions that a historian wouldn't ask. And a historian wouldn't ask like a counterfactual question, for example, like they would never say, what would the world be like if Hitler had never lived or something like that. Um, they just don't do it. They would also never say, imagine you're a slave and write a diary entry, 
or even like imagine you're a little child in Victorian times and write a diary entry. That's not the sort of questions they're interested in. Generally speaking, like moral questions as well tend to be out. Like it's not their job to like make moral judgments in terms of like should should Britain have should Britain have declared war on Hitler earlier? They may say what would what were the consequences of appeasement um, and and uh, and ask some of those secondary order sort of like questions. Asking really good sort of like disciplinarily valid questions is really, really hard, but it does, it helps massively in terms of there's a backwash effect in terms of you'll then teach better stuff because your stuff will be all geared towards that and it will be really focused and organized towards that and it will get children thinking in that way. So yeah, always, you know, curriculum's a process, not an event, always, always thinking about how we can improve. And, and, and that's definitely one of the areas that we think we, we probably need to take a bit of a a little bit of a swerve on at the moment. Nice. I'm really glad to ask because you've, you've codified or not, perhaps not codified, but classified that really well, the type of things you shouldn't ask. You know, I think it's really clear, you know, and actually, to be honest, I'm thinking, oh, maybe I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind teaching history sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there are plenty of people who are opposed to knowledge rich curricula. What arguments are usually leveled against this approach and do they hold any water? There are several reasons that people might be opposed to a knowledge rich curriculum. And, and, and since I've written a lot about it in support of it, um, have, have been helpfully challenged by, by people on it. I, I think that one thing to bear in mind, and I always try to bear this in mind on, on Twitter or when I'm writing and sort of getting comments on, on, on that, is we all want the same thing. Like, I, I hate this idea of like there are baddies and goodies. And there's like that. I've never, I don't know about you, I've never met anybody teacher working with kids who doesn't want anything other than kids to be like intelligent polite thoughtful creative like critical everybody wants that of, of kids there's just disagreement about how to best get there one of the most common arguments is that it's an assault on teacher autonomy that teachers should be the person sort of de de defining and deciding what they teach kids they know their kids best and so you hear phrases like a one size curriculum is good for like a, a one size of child or or something like that and and a one size fits one um and uh like a standardized curriculum is okay as long as you've got standardized children um you get those sorts of like arguments stuff i heard in my pgc quite a lot i think it's like really really and that that rhetoric is really unhelpful because i think it makes teachers feel bad about themselves when they use like resources and like not all resources are equal but but it creates this idea that like unless you built it from scratch unless you you know did the powerpoint and, and wrote the script like then you're somehow cheating and i think that that's bad for a few reasons first of all primary teachers we teach like 20 25 lessons a, a week even if you only spend half an hour preparing each of those lessons and that's not long enough to write a lesson plan a good lesson plan and, and, and powerpoint then you still need to find like an additional 12 hours in in the week to to like do that it's just not possible you are going to be using some sort of a resource unless we want to like burn all teachers into the ground the second thing is like i i don't think it's i, I think that we may be like fetishizing autonomy in, in a way that's unhelpful and, and it's not so much so it's not so much that like stealing like autonomy from teachers it's thinking about where their autonomy is best spent um, which I think goes back to the idea of I don't want autonomy to like write the maths curriculum from scratch I want I probably want autonomy in terms of like halfway through the lesson whether or not I go into independent practice or whether I do a little bit more modeling or whether I work with that group of kids um, whether I repeat a lesson because it didn't seem to work or whether like I want some autonomy around that thinking about autonomy at that enacted level I think is much more is much more helpful there are also some arguments especially around primary kids um, of like this is inappropriate for, for primary kids like they don't need to they they don't need that much knowledge or like it's, you know, it's, it's become an arms race in terms of like who can stuff the most knowledge into kids. And, and again, like, I, I just don't, I don't really buy that just out of like personal experience more than anything. Like kids just love learning loads of stuff, often like weird stuff, like kids just like become obsessed with the names of like trees or dinosaurs commonly, or like something. And, and that's probably quite healthy, like that they, it's a stage that you go through in terms of, I 
I just want to know everything about like this subject. And and so like I I don't think that that's from and like knowledge begets knowledge. Like the 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 more that they know, that like you your your head is what you carry around with you. And so you should you should fill it with like lots of interesting stuff and, and it's only going to serve them massively well in, in the future. And I don't tend to make that argument because like I'm not an instrumentalist on curriculum in, in, in that respect, really. I, I, I don't think that we do it so that they get great GCSEs. I think that that's a, a lovely byproduct. Like we learn, we learn about it because it's worth learning about. There's an intrinsic value to it, and and it's fascinating. And you'll be fascinating, um, and you'll be fascinated if you keep the content at the heart of it. Which is that's what should be fascinating. Like what should be fascinating about the Romans are like the Punic Wars and like Hannibal coming over the, the Alps and his, like you don't need to like fancy that up you don't need to like apologize or put gimmicks on that it is just absolutely fascinating if you if you sort of like stick with the content there's some stuff around like more around direct instruction versus inquiry-based learning which is kind of linked to it of like we shouldn't be setting the curriculum for kids we should be letting them explore their own interests I, I think that this is really appealing especially if you've been in if you've been in like a, a, an early years classroom or, or a, a key stage one classroom, um, maybe not so much year two, but, but in, into year one, you'll see kids doing like discovery, like inquiry learning, where they're following their own interests and they're, you know, doing really thoughtful tasks that the um, uh, that the teachers there have, have set out. But there's no instruction. There's no direct instruction. They, they, they might have had some input on the carpet half an hour ago and yet they're all really like they're obviously learning really purposefully learning that's a really persuasive intuitive argument of well what do we do to them between reception and year six that that makes that disappear and i think that this is just a bit of a fallacy that it is is perhaps sort of like addressed by thinking about biologically primary and biologically secondary knowledge and that it's not that we like get them to do less discovery learning it's just that when you're little, like you, you can learn quite a lot about the world by just playing an experiment. And that's the best way to do it because what you're effectively doing is like building up folk knowledge of like physics and, and, and chemistry. Like when I, what happens when I pour water, what happens when I pour water through this thing, you're slowly building up those sorts of like basic principles. And David Geary calls those biologically primary knowledge that stuff like talking and um, general social interaction, um, what happens when you drop things, folk physics. And he sort of says like, we almost everybody just develops that naturally through play mimicry and, and, and experimentation. It doesn't need to be taught. And usually speaking, it's because it needs to be, um, it, it's, it's like pretty crucial for survival. And so it's, it's evolutionary pre-wired for that reason. Then there's like biologically secondary culture, which is like Pythagoras theorem and the Mona Lisa and reading we're not biologically pre-wired to do those things like that stuff doesn't just happen by accident it happens through careful instruction and um that's the reason that there was mass illiteracy until about 50 years ago and that's the reason that like if you if you just sort of like leave a leave a child to it they they won't just stumble upon calculus um <laughs> whereas if you just leave a child to it. They will learn to learn to talk and learn to share and, and those sorts of things. The, the trouble is that children, are, as they go through school, they, they, they're doing far less of the biologically primary stuff because that's cracked and nailed. And they're doing far more of the biologically secondary stuff. And we know that because when we go into the early years classroom, when are they doing the direct instruction? Well, it's for stuff like phonics and, and it's for stuff like um, subitizing. And, and it's, it's stuff like where actually this is quite biologically secondary we need to go to the instruction like now now we need to have like really clear modeling breaking down into small parts and, and i also think that generally speaking like you see the best direct instruction in, in reception classrooms like if i go into a primary school almost always the best direct instruction is happening in, in reception classrooms because they're just masters of working with almost nothing like there's there's very little prior knowledge there you know if you're doing if you're teaching them sat for phonics like but they they don't currently have any gpcs and so like they're, they're starting with nothing thinking really carefully about how you then break it down into its absolute smallest sort of constituent parts making sure that there's low like in the cognitive language of cognitive 
in science, like there's low element interactivity um, to, to allow them to gradually build up complexity. Yeah, like I say, almost always in the reception classroom, I think we would do a lot better to all of us as primary teachers should do a lot better to sort of like go and see a bit more of that and think about how we could use some of that in our classrooms. I often think that reception teachers achieve as much in a 10 minute carpet session than, than I achieved in a 60 minute lesson, um, just because they were teaching so much better. So I think that there's some of the there's some of the common ones um, that I mean, like I say, it's been unhelpfully ideologized um, as well. Where it's you know that I think that there's a concern. This is you know this is a Tory policy. This is a Gove, Gove's policy, um, and and like uh, generally speaking, I think I, it doesn't really matter which political party it's associated with. Like I have never voted for the Conservative Party and and, and wouldn't. I happen to think that they have like really good at like education policies and the, and the sort of policies that my that my side should be making, which is quite annoying. <laughs> but but it doesn't really matter. Like it, I, like I, I think that it's 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 a bit immature to sort of like basically say I'm not going to do this because the Conservatives said it and they're not my favourites. Um, yeah, and then the last point, which I which I obviously spoke about, earlier, which I think is probably does hold water, is the. The idea that like this can lead to dull lessons and it can I don't buy that it leads to like de-skilling of teachers like because I think as you mentioned like it, it what it hopefully does is actually improves teachers subject knowledge and improves their sort of like instruction because we've thought about how we're breaking it down and sort of building up towards more complexity and so I think just the act of teaching using things like knowledge rich curricular resources can help you to become a better teacher but I do think it can sometimes promote Teachers are extremely busy. If you know that you've got a booklet on, on the side and you've got a million other things to do, it is possible to think, pass the booklets out, open to page five, and then every slide's a surprise. And it's like, what's coming up next? And it's this paragraph and it's possible to do that. And that's obviously not good practice. We So we the way that we get around that, um, that it is, we do expect our teachers to have completed the lesson before they teach it. So we ask, they have a teacher copy and we ask them to basically complete the questions and, and annotate the text. Um, they don't have to complete a lesson plan, but that that is like an expectation. because it, And it just means that they've A, read all of the stuff that they're going to be teaching and so know it, thought a little bit about like what they're going to add to it, how they're going to bring stuff to life, which kids they're going to ask questions to, what they might want to, where they might want to take a little bit of a tangent and show a great video or get a debate going or whatever it is that, that helps to bring it to life. And so it can it can lead to dull lessons or, or teachers sort of like not engaging in a way that they should. Uh, I think that that does hold water and that needs to be carefully thought about by especially sort of senior leaders that are implementing this as a curriculum across the school. I would imagine you guys also have very sensible workload policies in place that support teachers in avoiding becoming so busy yeah so we we, we try to I, th I don't think you'd find anybody that says that they don't find they don't take work-life balance seriously we, we 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 try and sort of put our money where our mouth is so we stopped we stopped sort of like marking outside of lessons about about four four years ago maybe we quickly realized like this wasn't a particularly good use of teachers time we're really careful to sort of think about opportunity and cost in terms of what what do we think makes the biggest difference and how do we free up teachers time to do that so like some of the things we think that like instructional coaching which we're going to talk about makes a big difference um, and so we we sort of like make sure that that's locked in and that means that we don't have teachers doing like as much like silly stuff we went to like three assessment points where I think that a lot of people were still doing six like we, we shifted to three assessment points a year quite early we try and we try and be sort of like really thoughtful about that I think that everybody I think that most people hopefully are um but we we have quite a good I think quite a good like culture of challenge in terms of like a nonsense like nonsense culture of like this is nonsense we're not doing it like this looks like nonsense could you do this that's nonsense I'm not not putting all of those things in a spreadsheet <laughs> Yeah, was well, it the Robbie Downey Jr. gif where he's rolling his eyes with his arms folded? <laughs> That's what I always think of whenever <laughs> stuff comes up. <laughs> so once we have a solid curriculum in place, what do schools need to do to take that next step and see it realised in the way the authors envisaged? 
So I think that there are two things that um, for, for us make a big difference. Subject knowledge, I think, is, is it, I'm predicting it's going to be the next big thing. For for you to teach really great lessons, I I think it's it's really difficult to shortcut that without sort of having good subject knowledge. And we we know that, right? Because when you're teaching a topic which you know really well, then those lessons just go really well. They're really exciting. There's a fizz, like you're getting great questions, you're giving great questions. You can just teach with the level of depth um, and nuance that you otherwise can't. I mean, the rub is that like we're primary teachers and you can't just overnight become like a subject expert in the Aztecs, the climate, the multiplying fractions and what like how to do a cartwheel or how to play a scale on the like record and like everything else that we expect primary teachers to do. And so it is really difficult because on the one hand, we think it makes all the difference. And on, on, on the other hand, we think it's relatively unreasonable to expect primary teachers to, to, to suddenly do it. And so again, that's part of the work booklet to at least it at least provides a, a sort of like a, a pricey and intro so that there's a there's a base level. But we would always say that like teachers should be spending time thinking more about that subject. And we we would like how often do you see primary teachers just like reading a book on history in the in the PPA room? They probably like in most schools, I think they'd probably be told to like stop and get on with some work. <laughs> and Whereas actually, like, if you're teaching the First World War, going and watching like a really good BBC documentary on the First World War may well be some of the best planning that you can do and some of the best professional development that you can do for that. And so encouraging and, and putting in place the, the sort of like conditions for teachers to develop their subject knowledge, I think is, is, is one of the huge ones. And then the second one is um, thinking about like the way that it's enacted, like we talked about before, in terms of thinking about the the, the sorts of um, the the variety of tasks and questions that that make the lessons engaging for for children and 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 promote sort of like thinking hard about the about the content. That again is really really hard. So we often talk about like ratio there the participation and, and thinking ratio which is one of another one of Doug Lamar from uh, teach like a champion sort of like techniques really what we want is we want all of the children thinking really hard about whatever it is that we want them to remember very often though if we increase participation ratio then we sort of lower thinking ratio so it's relatively easy to get like all the kids doing something if that thing is not that hard um, so if you just tell them to sort of like jot down a sentence about like what they did, how they got to school, like fine, that like pretty much everybody would be able to do that, but they don't have to think very hard about it. When we increase the thinking ratio, and so we say, for, for example, who do you think was to blame for the death of Thomas Beckett, then the participation ratio can quite often go down because like a bunch of kids are likely to sort of check out, it's too hard, they can't really remember, like we, all humans are basically wired to like, not think hard if we can at all help it <laughs> it expends like too much energy and so think teachers the the next level would be like when i go in and see lessons and i'm like oh my gosh this is great i, I don't know about you probably all have markers for the, this but where there's a level of like there's a huge level of excitement from the children about what it is that they're learning and what they're learning is like it's challenging and it's like interesting and it's like th those two things are, are sort of like the two markers like is what they're learning really hard like is it challenging um and like are the kids like working hard on that stuff um uh, are the kids thinking hard about it there is i think there is that sort of like without going into the lesson observations and the and the, and the sort of like the the lack of reliability around that it is also true that sometimes you go into a classroom and you're like something's happening here like there's something going on in here and I want to bottle it. Um, and if you can get that in all of the lessons, I think a big part of it is having really great subject knowledge um, and, and the ability to, to thinking about how, ahead of time about how you're going to get all the children thinking of it. And I'm not like, I've talked a little bit about obviously explicit instruction and direct instruction. And, and that's thinking that's, that's, that's um, 
the, probably the best way that we can promote like a lot of um, uh, understanding in, in, in children. But there are, there are other like doing a debate is a really good way, to, I think, to increase participation ratio and thinking ratio of like you, you've spent some time teaching a con, like a concept and then getting children to write a defense or a proposition sort of like um, argument, even if it's only a paragraph or so. Everybody can write it because they've been learning about it all lesson. And then like now everybody has a paragraph. Well, actually, like you can structure like a class debate now and, and everybody can be involved because they've got their paragraph in front of them and they're thinking really hard about the stuff. Um, and it's also like an exciting lesson and one that you we don't. And I still feel guilty if I, you know, if I've just stood at the front and sort of like even if it's interactive, if I stand at the front and just do that like all day long, still feel a little bit guilty of like would have been nice to give the kids a little bit of variety in the day. In the, in the day. So yeah, I think those are the two things, increasing subject knowledge and trying to increase both participation and thinking ratio um, by, by giving a sort of variety of uh, tasks in the lesson. How many people do you reckon need oversight? You know, taking into account all the things you've talked about, you know, the sequence and the inaction. Is it possible, you know, I'm, I'm imagining Neil right now, you know, Neil with his view of the whole curriculum and what's happening. What would your ideal situation be in terms of how many people are over, overseeing the the curriculum within a school? I think so. Yeah. So in, in a school, we have all this, all the pieces in place for this really high quality education. What does your sort of oversight look like? It is almost impossible for a classroom teacher to sort of like see that bigger picture. We need to promote as much as possible an understanding of what what's come before and what's going to come afterwards so that when they're teaching it, they can sort of make those links. And we try and build those into our into our booklets. We sort of have like this reminds me sort of things, little little boxes where we talk about previous units. I think that it's really important that like the head teacher sees them like a big part of the head teacher's role is they see themselves as the person that basically knows the journey as, as children go through then I think that you you need subject leads who are able to have the, the the time to ensure that that's sort of like fitting together. We had subject leads for humanities, science, maths, English, PE and phonics in, in, in our school. And the, the humanities lead, the idea would be that they are going into lessons every week um to basically sort of like make sure that there is that 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 sort of like progression in terms of like what the children are learning and how they're learning it so yeah i think that like that that role has changed a bit like i think the subject coordinator role for, for lots of people and it, it, it did sort of used to be like you hand out the topic titles and that's pretty much your job done <laughs> you might do a book book every now and then um, Whereas actually like being the owner of I know what every child is going to know um, as, as they move through. That's that's the shift, I think. Yeah, I remember being RE coordinator. I think it was my second year. And my job was to organize the the, fit, the religious festivities, you know, Christmas, <laughs> Easter and <laughs> whatever else there might have been. Yeah, no, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I'm just I'm thinking as if I'm someone who was listening to previous episodes and trying to what, what sort of questions might they be thinking about? You've, you've tied quite a lot of themes really well together thank you in my opinion assessment of the foundation subjects is, is quickly becoming the new challenge in depth for all pupils you know during external validation processes you know one kind or another what advice do you have to anyone who has this development point leveled at them i do think that it's it's good that we are thinking about how we assess the foundation subjects because i think it's a bit of a dirty secret and that we basically just didn't for a long time or if we did we ticked off like little objective boxes on a spreadsheet somewhere and, and ragged those. And, uh, and I don't think that, that that really counts as assessment because those descriptors tended to be things like, I can understand chronology, um, like and they get a green or a developing or emerging or whatever. I just don't know what that means. Like, do they understand chronology? Like I've got kids in year one that understand chronology and I've got kids in year six that understand chronology is it is it a useful and and they understand chronology in terms of they know that it was the paleolithic era then the mesolithic era then the neolithic era but they don't really understand chronology in terms of the march of the sort of like history in terms of like technological developments over time or 
and so they're so vague as to be like completely unhelpful i think um so so i so i think it is useful that we're thinking like well, what does it mean to assess foundation subjects because if you came to if you were if you went to any primary school in the country and went to a teacher and said here's a story that a year four kid has written they would be able to look at it and tell you like straight away like oh, that's but that's pretty good year four yeah that's good for a year four or like gosh like that's not that's not very good if they're in year four like that that's not great I don't think that we could do the same with geography work. Like, I don't think that teachers have a good mental model of like, that's good year three geography work. That's good year three geography writing or like, is it writing? Is that what they should be spending their time doing? And so I think it's useful to say like, what, what, what does good look like? What like, can we have some examples? What does good look like in music at year three, in art at year six? And, and that's where I think that we, the, the, the sort of concepts of sort of like validity and reliability are quite helpful in terms of for, for a measurement to be valid, like it should be measuring what it purports to measure. Um, and so when like, if we want to measure good history, like for, for year four, well, what, what does that mean? Well, it need, they need to be doing history. Like there's no point in us, for example, um, assessing their, their Roman shield because it's not his, they're not doing any history there. And so that brings us then to the question of like, well, what like what do we want them to what what do we want them to be able to do, and what do we want them to like know? Um, and we, for example, have two for for our um, RE history and geography, and leaving the other foundation subjects out of, out of the way for the moment. We do both knowledge quizzes and and, and essays. We used to assess them every half term we think that actually that's not helpful um and, and we think probably once a year maybe once a term is is enough um for that so we use comparative judgment to um, rank order the essays which then gives us an idea of who is writing the best essays and, and who's who perhaps requires some more support it also means that we then like have a bank of model exemplars for the next year in terms of last year this was like the the, the median history essay in this specific topic which is helpful for teachers in terms of like okay i've got a general idea of like that sort of benchmark and then using the knowledge quizzes means like i said that i was going to teach them about ancient greece and about like the Peloponnesian Wars, like, do they remember what the Peloponnesian Wars were like? Who they, who they were between? Like, if they if they don't now, and it's only two weeks after we learned them, then they're definitely not going to know next year. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I think that they can be useful for each. And, and similarly with stuff like music, like, what do you want them to know? What do you want them to be able to do? Like, those are useful things in terms of I. In, in year three, I want them to be able to read basic music. I want them to know about notation and, and maybe like be able to read five notes. Um, and um, I also want them to be able to play those five notes on a ukulele or a recorder or, or whatever it is. And I also want them to be able to like tap a rhythm of like four beats. Um, and I also want them to know the, the main groups in an orchestra. Um, and I also want them to know five genres, like whatever it is, like, you know, we can we can have that conversation for a while and different schools will sort of come to different conclusions. And, and again, that speaks to like the sequencing of curriculum. But if you said like, you want to know the main groups of the orchestra, like that is what you assess, that's what you test. Like you ask them that question, like you give them a multiple choice or you give them a, a sort of like, that. that is what you then check. And if you said that you want them to be able to play you know, play three blind mice on on the recorder, then then that is what you would check for everybody at, at, at the end of it to see whether they can actually do it. And and if they can't, then you failed in your job as a teacher because that's what you said that you were going to do for them. So trying to maintain that idea for for, for foundation subjects of, okay, what do we want them to know and what do we want them to be able to do? We want to know this, all of this about the migration of peoples. Like we want to know all about this about migrations of peoples. We also want them to be able to construct a box like con construct a, a bar chart to be able to like display like some simple data or um navigate themselves navigate around the playground using like a compass like different points 
if that's what you've decided, then that's what you assess them on. Um, and, and I want it to be concrete in terms of, yes, they can do it, or no, they can't do it. Yes, they can know it. No, they can't know it. I don't want like emerging can critically analyze sources, but I don't know what that means. That, that, that could potentially be my favorite answer if someone's given. It's one of the few questions that I didn't think I could work out what, what the answer was going to be before I asked it. Um, but it, it just makes so much sense. So I'm, I'm genuinely learning uh, as I'm listening here. So I think we're going to move towards, you know, further from the classroom and towards, you know, sort of teacher CPD. You're focused right now on cradle to career at the REACH Foundation. What does that entail? And what potential do you think such an approach has? Cradle to career, it's actually before cradle because we, we do some like antenatal stuff as well. Um, it means that we both convene and provide services for the, for the community beginning at, at sort of birth or just before birth and, and, and going on to after they leave us from, from 18, including working with families and adults, um, perhaps parents. And we do that in a few different ways. So we, we sort of have our naught to two. We have our antenatal and neonatal sort of like support work with parents and then naught to two stuff around stay and play, parent support groups and, and, and various sorts of like projects and doing like family links courses. Our nursery begins at, at two um, up to age five. And, and we have a nursery that's on site and has close sort of like cohesion with the rest of our school. The school was opened in 2012 by Ed and Rebecca, as I, as I mentioned before, and I think that it, it went on and got like, like insanely good results. So the secondary, like in the secondary school, the GCSE results were like, I think in the top 10 in the country or something like that. And, and the results have remained like really high and we believe in academic rigor and, and, and so like that, that it's good that that, 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 is, that, that has a sort of like that they've been able to achieve that. But I think that one of the things that we learned quite quickly was a great school is necessary but not sufficient, especially for like a lot of a lot of our more vulnerable families and for the community. And we also we don't believe that success in our community is getting out of our community. And, and I think that we're we're like we're uncomfortable with that narrative sometimes being given of like you live in a crap community, but if you work hard, you'll get great A levels, you can go to Oxford and you can live in London and, and then like you won't live in like that for us it's investing in the community in terms of we want this community to be at like a, how you want it to be. Like it's it's underserved at the moment. Like you 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 simply don't have the same resources and opportunities that other com other communities have like why is london nice to 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 live why is why is like covent garden nice to nice to live in well there's loads of culture and wealth and jobs and um restaurants and like okay so let's put those things in our community rather than like going let's have those things in our community like let's work to sort of like build those things here rather than sort of like getting people out and so the cradle to career was like a big part of that in terms of like trying to provide for the community all, all of those different bits. We think that it's replicable and we're, we're trying now to think about, we're working with um, uh, about a dozen partners who are sort of like mat leaders or school leaders in other parts of the country who want to develop a sort of cradle to career model. But we think, we definitely think it's not like reach has all of the answers and so copy us like we we think that it's so context dependent um and we really like we're talking a bit more about the process of, that we went through because we're a few years down the line now that, and we hope that will be helpful so we one of the things that we did was like a listening project so we just spent six months just listening to our community and doing a thing called like listening without agenda so um so it's a good question of like, when was the last time you had a conversation in school um, with anybody where you didn't have an agenda? Um, and the answer is like, probably not as often as you, as you should, especially when it comes to parents. And so, yeah, we like, that's probably a useful starting point. Understanding your demographics and like the, the data in terms of like knowing your community really, really well is, is a useful starting point and loads of that's publicly available. If it's not publicly available, it's pretty easy to find and you might have to do like a £10 FOI and then you know like progression to university rates within your area, for example, or um, the intergenerational sort of like uh, poverty in, in your area um, and, and specifically like at a postcode level, like where that exists. And, you might want to like then map on like your 
the children who have had the most detentions or, or sort of like sanctions, you might realize that like they're all coming from like the same estate or they're all coming from the same postcode, which is useful in terms of like, okay, so, so how, like, what do we do here? Like, and also thinking like about the asset, so, so it's not just a deficit, but I think about the assets in terms of like what assets already exist in this community, what partnerships can be forged. It may well be that there's actually a, you know, there's a, a youth worker that's crying out for, for kids to, to, to work with. And you just reaching out and saying like, Hey, we've got these seven kids who we think would really benefit from a half hour after school with somebody they may may well bite your hand off and say, "Great, I'll come, I'll do it." So we've been this. That's what we've been trying to develop. We, it's, it's going to be a long term thing. We're working with these people over these these uh, trusts over the next three years. Really, really, really excited to see what they because because I, I think that there's going to be everybody's going to come to different, slightly different solutions and models, and um, uh, it's going to be hopefully great to see. And, and and we hope that in those communities that becomes a really sustainable resource that the whole community can benefit from and that enriches the community and places a school like back at the heart of the the community that sounds, sounds absolutely wonderful um, yeah I'm, I'm, in my mind i'm trying to think how can i how can i get us involved in that? you know because you know when you're talking about you know context specific i've got two schools that are 0.7 miles from each other i think a totally different you know the, the the areas around them are totally you know and it, it's it's not even a ten minute walk you know so I, I totally understand that um, and I'm looking forward to seeing how that develops over over time. And I think I'm right in thinking that instructional coaching plays quite a big role in this. What does effective IC look or feel like to you? Within everything that we do, we think that like there there are probably three things that that are really important. Certainly at the school level, but also some of this wider sort of like C to C stuff. And, and we think that that's like developing people really well. And we do that through instructional coaching, having a really clear vision in terms of like the sequencing of like knowledge. Um, and, and that's like curriculum development. And the last is like relationships, like really strong relationships at the heart of, of, of everything in terms of like fostering great relationships between kids, between staff and kids, between staff and staff, between staff and families, and like constantly sort of like investing in that and holding ourselves to account on that. The instructional coaching is something that the school was, it was one of the things that really attracted me to the school. It was something they were doing before I joined that Ed and, and, and Bex sort of said, like, this is something that's really, really important. Nothing's more important than like the teacher in front of the classroom, in front of the class and them being as, as like as good as they can be. Instructional coaching is an approach to developing teachers incrementally in, in, in a sustained fashion quite small bite size uh, steps and so it involved for us it would involve an expert coach so uh, a teacher who has been teaching for who is an experienced teacher and who has a, a record of sort of like doing doing well in the classroom and understanding sort of like pedagogy and being knowledgeable about cognitive science for example like they would be the coach um, and they have a coachy um, a, a teacher once a week they drop into that teacher's classroom and they they look at the they look at the teaching um and then they'll have a, a coaching meeting afterwards um probably probably that same day after school um maybe later on that week and the the coach will identify one gap in practice and, and when i say gap really what i mean is thinking about the goal like what what does the teacher want to achieve and thinking about what what they were doing like it may be that in lots of cases that's the same like you wanted all the children to come in sit down and begin their do now and they all did like uh, so there's no gap there so there's no coaching there like they all they all did so then you might turn to okay well what were they doing on the do now like what was the activity they were doing to begin with and again like state your aim like what what's the purpose of this i wanted them all to like recall this information so that i would know like whether i needed to recap okay and what do they do once they finish their do now? We just cracked on with the lesson. Oh, hold on a second. You just said that you wanted that information so you knew whether to do a recap or not, but you didn't You didn't really know until after the lesson. So there's a, maybe a gap there. Maybe there's a coaching point there of like, how can we close that gap? Which leads to the, the, the action step where you either co-construct or the teacher might offer or the coach might offer a, a way to close that gap, depending on probably where the teacher is in terms of their experience. More experienced teachers, they may say like, yeah, that was really stupid. Like I, I, I could have really easily found out like how many kids knew by circulating with a clipboard or by just doing a quick like one, two, three, sort of like show me the answer. That's what I'll do next time. 
Um, whereas with more novice teachers, the coach might need to be a little bit more directive in terms of to hear a few different things that you could do to close that gap. Then crucially, this is the bit that's often missed out, um, you practice, so you, you simulate it. So you, you say, okay, so we're gonna imagine that you're in the next lesson and the kids have come in and they're doing their do now. What are you gonna say? What are you gonna do? Um, and we'll get them to like script it and write it down. And then we get them to practice it. And, and we, we practice it to the point of automation. So we practice and we repeat and we repeat and repeat like a soldier taking his rifle apart. Like it, it, it's, it, we, we do it until they can't get it wrong. Um, because when you go back into the classroom, you've got a million things to think about. Teachers jobs are incredibly complex. Um, the, the chances of like, you deferring to the, 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 what you've always done are incredibly high because that's what you'll do um, if you're thinking about other stuff. So we think that the, and they'll get one of those each, each week, which means that over the course of a year, you'll have 39 of those action steps. Um, that they need to be like really bite-sized. So just, so just a really small sort of thing. It doesn't cost any extra workload. It's just a different way of like doing something. They need to be really measurable. So you'll be able to, 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 to sort of like see them um, and, and they need to be actionable. It needs to be something they can actually do. Again, sometimes coaching can sort of go into like planning conversations, which isn't really the point. It's the point of like what you're doing in the classroom. Great coaching for us is it's it's one to one. It's really focused. Um, it's it's really sustained um, uh, over time. Um, and, and there there are a couple of other markers that Matthew Craft gives around uh, great coaching. But but those for us are the, are the are the main the main sort of ideas around great coaching. And so for those interested in exploring um, instructional coaching, where are they going for inspiration? Uh, you know, what are they reading? And what pitfalls do they need to watch out for? And you've already mentioned one. The book that we would probably recommend the most is Leverage Leadership by Paul Bambrick Santoyo, um, or perhaps another that he wrote called Get Better Faster. Um, so um, Paul Bambrick Santoyo uh, worked on common schools with Doug Lamov and um, instructional coaching goes back, you know, for as, as long as, as time and memorial. Like people have always sort of like coached each other people in, in, in relatively like specific ways. It's often... Um, sort of compared to sports coaching where like you, you, you view an athlete and you give them specific feedback and get them to practice again. Gym night is often sort of like seen as a bit of the father within schools of, of instructional coaching. I think that the impact cycle and his book instructional coaching are both great and really useful. I think that his model of instructional coaching, which he calls sort of like dialogical coaching is probably for me, I think it's not as directive as might be helpful. Um, and and they, there's quite a lot of sort of like the teacher decides and, and co-constructing and, and drawing out of the teacher in a way that we we probably find found hasn't been that helpful with teachers. So we'd recommend Get Better Faster or Leverage Leadership, where the, there's a six-step model in that, which is usually just sort of refined down to see it, name it, do it, um, in, in terms of like the steps that you go through. I think that that's what we would recommend. You know, you've got three sources there at least that you can go, people can go to and sort of dip their toe in the water. Because I think yeah. that one of the big things is we've got all these teachers who are very keen to become coaches, but not necessarily with the the, the requisite knowledge and um, understanding. Yeah. So I think the, the more we can... Oh, I, I also wrote a chapter on it in a book called Research Ed Guide to Leadership. So people can go and read that chapter if they want to. <laughs> I've heard lots of good things. I and mean, I do need to get to, to get on board with that. Um, but I'm currently studying at the minute as well. So my, my reading has been dictated for me. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I but I, I like that series. I've read Myths and I've read Curriculum. So leadership makes sense. I think it's is it the most recent one or one of the most re one of the more recent ones? Uh, I think it came out about the same time as assessment. It might be the most recent, actually. Yeah, Stuart Lockett did it. So you have a master's in education from the University of Cambridge in which you focus, and this is really interesting, on the intersection between educational effectiveness of research and school improvement. What did you learn from your studies? So I went through like uh, waves of sort of like disillusionment in terms of like the whole discipline isn't really a discipline, like we don't know anything, everything's so vague, the studies are like, there's, there's, a, there's a joke in one of the research papers that I read of like, where are you from? The Faculty of Education education that's who the economists laugh at um and became yeah a little bit disillusioned went through like ways that the main thing around like so what's called eer educational effectiveness research it was previously called like school effectiveness research is that 
we do actually know quite a bit about what makes effective education. So it goes way back to like a study from 66 by James Coleman, where the, the conclusion that was given was schools don't make any difference. Um, so family background factors, that makes all of the, that explains all the variation between like outcomes and schools don't make any difference. And there was a similar sort of like finding from Bernstein over, over here in the UK. And obviously, like too much consternation for lots of people of like, well, we would like to think that we do make a difference. Otherwise, what's the what's the point? And so there was then just like a, a couple of decades of like quantitative, like quantitative study in terms of can any variation be explained other like even when background factors are, are controlled for and it's and, and, and there, there could be. So we now know that like di like even when kids have similar backgrounds and outcomes in some schools they do better than in other schools and in fact that led to like what was called multi-level modeling where they were we moved from not just thinking about a school level but thinking about pupil characteristics teacher level school level and then like district level or policy level um, and all of those things are sort of like dynamically interacting and, and related but one of the findings that came out of that is that probably the teacher effect is 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 greater than the school effect it's still not huge so it's not as huge i think as many people would like to admit like it, it, it maybe accounts for somewhere between 10 and 30 percent of the variation between uh, pupil outcomes um, and so those background characteristics st still do dictate a lot but we we started to realize that okay schools can and do make a difference and teachers specifically can and do make a difference there's more variation within schools than between schools for example so we knew that the, the next thing that we needed to know was like how and, and why. And that's where we've got a bit stuck. That's where we needed to move from like quantitative studies to more qualitative studies because we, it, the, the findings lacked what David Reynolds called uh, rich, thick descriptions of, okay, so you say that this school is getting better results than other schools. Well, how are they doing that? Why are they doing that? And Hellinger and Heck have a sort of anecdote where they talk about school leadership and they're speaking at a conference about their life's research and a, a principal comes up to them and says everything you know about leadership and educational effectiveness like what should I be spending my time doing as a head teacher and they said like they they couldn't really give him any advice um and and like <laughs> and where like when you do look at like the criteria of like this is what effective like educational effectiveness looks like this is what really great schools do it tends to be like pretty vague like they have high expectations, like they have policies in place. Um, and so stuff that most school leaders and teachers would look at and probably say like, well, duh. Um, and I think there's a bit of like, well, it wasn't always well, duh. So, so it's kind of like that, that's progress in a way. But when you try and get more specific, you tend to lose the, you tend to lose the sort of like the, the evidence base in terms of um there hasn't there although there might be good solid evidence that you know having high expectations of pupils um will will help them to be um get better grades the same when you try and say so what does having high expectations mean oh, well it means you know getting every kid to write i will get an a star in the back of their book at the start of the year like well, there's no evidence that that helps um and, and it may well not do um and and so the the that's why we haven't anywhere in the world managed to, even though for, for, you know, for 30 or 40 years, we've known that there's just difference in schools and had some ideas of how they're achieving that. We haven't successfully managed to, to do school improvement on like a, a whole scale. And um, yeah, so that, that was one of the things that I, that, that, I, that I learned not to be too defeatist about it. And is there, is there any practical advice you think anyone who listens to what you've learned and wants to act on, you know, should be armed with before they make any change to their working practices? My advice would be just like read, uh, read a lot. Um, and that sounds like quite obvious advice. One of my big concerns, and I think we'll go into this with like instructional coaching is one of the things that, that, that I found looking into educational effectiveness research, but research around expertise more generally is you, you can't, you can't shortcut building like a strong knowledge base. Like whenever you look at expertise in any domain, they, like there, there is always experts within that domain have large amounts of knowledge stored in long-term memory. Like that's what makes them experts. And it's tough as teachers because we're really time poor, but 
we get these lethal mutations and we ruin potentially relatively good ideas by just not knowing enough about the nuts and bolts that underpin it. So like, it's not enough just to like see on Twitter that retrieval practice is like big now and then start giving kids like quizzes, like just read one paper at least. So just read like one chapter, read like, read like something around like, well, why and how and uh, d might this be, be successful or what what could be the potential like sort of like pitfalls here how might we get this wrong um so yeah th th unfortunately there's there there are no and you can't really sell that <laughs> which is why there's some people going around saying well you just do this thing and then everything is fixed it doesn't exist like the you know it's like the the fad diet books right like the, the, if you like the the truth of the diets is like eat less exercise more like that's it like but you can't sell it and so they say oh here's the celery diet and like it's all about like how much celery you eat and there's a whole book on it just become knowledgeable like and 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 then like you'll be able to implement sort of policies and and do better things in school with with fidelity to research that, that analogy is fantastic i always say to lloyd no one would buy his weight loss book because there's too much common sense and you know <laughs> and too much hard work in there you know because yeah. he's, he's done a fantastic job this last year like you say, eating well, exercising regularly, you know, but no one wants to buy that, do they? And also thinking about whatever you're saying, you know, there's a certain level you can't go down and, and then the reliability of the of the inferences you can make sort of degrades. And um, it's like when I ask people the same question on this on this podcast and you can get totally different answers. But, you know, you, you know, from knowing the people maybe visiting their schools that the outcomes are are one and the same. Yeah. So I think, yeah, the more. The more people we have reading, you know, getting that 25% who've read something more than a pamphlet about education in the last 12 months, you know, if, if we can get that number up to 50%, then we're moving the, <laughs> the right direction. Yeah. Before I let you go, um, I have to ask you about the ECF. It appears to me to have massive potential for good. What will need to happen for it to be as successful as we all want it to be? Stuart and I have been, so Stuart was another member on the group, been talking and thinking about this a lot. So the polite way, how how can we not screw up the um, the the ECF as a profession? We use less polite language in, in, in private. We think that obviously we we think that the ECF has huge potential, and, and happily it has great um, sector buy-in. Like it's been really really well received, and um, and we were worried that it wouldn't be because it would, it's another thing being done to to schools and teachers and we're really pleased that like we, we've got initial buy-in and and the stuff in there is really good there's lots of really sensible sort of like principles within the framework of what what teachers should know and what they should do we all wish that we'd had it when when we were training um because it's going to give them it's going to arm them with like a knowledge base and, uh, and and a set of practices that allow them to really be sensational teachers um and that's to the benefit of kids right there are a couple of ways that we can like that we can screw this up um and and probably we should probably be aware of the fact that like we are quite good at this in schools of of like taking growth mindset or like whatever it is and 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 like bastardizing it um well well how do we do that well one of the things is to my last point like we just don't do the reading like we 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 are, we if it's not on a poster then we're not interested and so failing to to like engage in a level of depth with some of the material will just mean that you get like very superficial and uh, um, sort of like actions and understanding um, which won't have the sort of impact that, that, that it potentially could have. I think the second one is at the moment the ECF is like relatively generic because we wanted one framework for the for the whole sector. We spoke about this like quite a lot in the group and we we did actually think about, you know, is there a different one for science and maths? And then we talked about, well, maybe you'd need different ones for primary then. And we thought it's, it's kind of, it would be silly to, you know, before you'd have to have three or four ring binders. Um, and, and so instead we went for those more generalized statements that we could be a bit more secure in terms of the evidence base, but it, it needs to be translated into phase and stage. And, and so we're trusting like the, the, the mentors to do that work with the teacher of, okay, so the principle here is around, um, for, for example, like retrieving, retrieving information regularly. What does that look like in 
music in year 10 um like what what could that look like how are we going to sort of like interpret and translate that so translating it so, so that it so that it um it can be implemented to specific phases i think that that's going to be something that's that's really really important it will happen if it hasn't already happened i'm sure it will happen turning the ecf into like a checklist it will immediately kill it. Like it's probably on a website somewhere where somebody's taken the statements and put little check boxes next to them or put it on a spreadsheet and like said, like you should do green boxes as they move through. It's lit, if you if you download the actual ECF, it's literally in bold letters on like page two, like do not turn this into a checklist. Do not use this as an assessment tool. That's not the purpose of it. Um, it would it will ruin it. Like it is a framework. It is a, a, a base, a resource, or a, a, a reference guide in, in order to sort of like think about how you develop a teacher. The, we would say to like schools listening now, like use a provider because one of the dangers as well is that a school looks at it and they go, yeah, yeah, yeah we do all of that. You don't, like you just don't um, because it's incredibly ambitious and like there's stuff in there that I don't like, that I don't do and that I would need to um, read, read up more, more on. Um, and, and that was true for everyone in the group. It was um, written by like a big range of, of, of experts, like checked by the, the EEF and no matter like you may well be doing like a great induction for your for your NQTs and you may be really proud of that and great you'll still be able to do like a lot of that work but you're not doing everything in there at the moment and the best way to like the best way to get all of it in there is to use a national provider use it doesn't matter like that they're, they're, they're all great um like i think that the teach first and ambition institute in particular um programs are are, are really really strong they've got videos in there which, which exemplify it they've got um uh, which exemplify what it looks like in practice they've got little sort of like talking heads that explain some of the concepts they've got further reading they break down the stuff it's sequenced into a curriculum over the two years i think that that is also really important so subject specificity maintain fidelity to the actual research base don't like read that read the stuff like engage in, in in depth sign up to a national provider um they, they would be like some of the best ways to safeguard again or oh, don't turn it into a checklist they would be some of the best ways to safeguard it um against uh being ruined it might possibly be the the most seismic shift in my certainly in my career you know i don't know if the, possibly more so than the national curriculum being rejigged in in 2012 but you i think you hit the nail on the head when you said we all wish we had it when we were starting to learn to teach because it would have made things so much more a, a much more fluid process you know because a lot of us have landed where we are by accident by reading lots and lots and lots with all this this stuff presented like you say with providers who have to meet certain thresholds and things you know i think it, it has massive potential to really improve the quality of teaching across all our schools so uh, my, my fingers are crossed yeah we were we were taking a we were taking a fingers crossed approach to like teacher induction basically like you may have landed in a school where people are talking about really sensible stuff and promoting that and like good for you if you were that certainly wasn't the case nationally and it was a massive look at the draw and you shouldn't have to spend your evening on twitter right like reading blogs by random science teachers to to like try and come across like a good idea um you should be gifted it just as if you if you become a lawyer like there's an accepted like canon of like expertise it's, it's kind of the mark of a profession just generally like one of the marks of a profession is that there is an accepted canon of like knowledge that there, there is like a, a body of knowledge um that that you develop expertise in um you know for doctors like you you know that they all know the names of all the different muscles and <laughs> like, the common symptoms of like diseases and like Grey's anatomy and 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 like we just didn't have that as teachers. It was, it was the, the shelf was literally bare. That there was nothing. And I remember in the group, I sort of like laid this, I, I, I laid this out in the group um, in, in some of like the really initial stages where I sort of said, um, tell me now, like you walk into any classroom in the country, you walk into a, you walk into a random school, walk into a random classroom, go to that teacher, what book? can you guarantee that they've read? And I don't think that that book exists. I don't think that there is a book that I can guarantee that I could just walk into any classroom. Now you can do that for doctors. You can walk into any hospital and like, and, and walk into any sort of like situation and say like, have you read 
whatever like the, the the medical textbooks is or Grey's Anatomy or whatever is like and all of them would be like yes of course like I wouldn't be able to be a doctor if I if I if I hadn't like they literally give us tests on it um same for lawyers same for, we just didn't have that for education it's like a bit and I think that's why we were a little bit during lockdown when when some parents were like oh teaching's like really easy i'm doing a great job of teaching teachers were like no it's not it's different like what you're doing isn't teaching like it's, it's completely different and, and got very cross and i think part of that was because we don't have that specialist knowledge all we have and and so when somebody says like you you know i can do this we didn't have much of a rebuttal other than like oh we don't think that you can because we didn't say like well no actually like what you don't have is like this thing I do have which is the specialized knowledge that all teachers have and so I, I hope that it would be really good for the image of the profession I hope that it will actually kick up perhaps sort of paradoxically like recruitment and retention because um, teachers are people are going to want to go into teaching because it feels like a rigorous thing where you're given this like really great induction and this specialized knowledge and having gone through it teachers are way more likely to stay in the profession because they they feel really well prepared and know a little bit more about where they might want to take their career and their expertise um so yeah as you say fingers crossed it's been absolutely fascinating start to finish um and i could probably go on for a couple more hours you know i won't, I won't obviously won't, won't hold you to that <laughs> but all said to say thank you very much for joining me today thank you it's it was really fun conversation i, I could also talk all day <laughs>